Picture this. It's the winter of 1957, and while most Americans are huddling around coal stoves and watching their breath fog up inside their own homes, there is a man in rural Vermont who is walking around his house in a t-shirt while a blizzard rages outside. And the secret to his comfort isn't some expensive heating system or a massive fireplace. It's something so simple, yet so brilliant, that when his neighbors first heard about it, they thought he'd lost his mind. His name was Robert McNamara, a 34-year-old carpenter from Rutland, Vermont. And what he did with a leftover military Quonset hut and an old stone foundation would change how people in his community thought about staying warm forever. The temperature outside was dropping to 15 below zero on most nights that winter. The kind of cold that makes your nose hairs freeze the second you step outside and inside most homes in Rutland. People were lucky if they could keep their living rooms at a barely tolerable 50 degrees. But Robert's S. Little Quonset home stayed at a steady 70 degrees without burning through cords of expensive firewood or rationed coal. Now you're probably wondering what kind of magic this man discovered, and I promise you, by the end of this story, you're going to understand exactly how he pulled off what seemed impossible. And more importantly, why almost nobody remembers his name today, even though his idea was pure genius. Robert wasn't a wealthy man, not by any stretch. He'd come back from the war like millions of other guys looking for a fresh start and a place to call his own, and when he saw those surplus Quonset huts being sold off cheap by the government, the same curved metal structures that had housed soldiers and supplies during the war, he saw something nobody else could see. Most people looked at those huts and saw cold, drafty, temporary shelters that would be miserable in a Vermont winter. But Robert looked at one and saw a home. Specifically, he saw a home that could sit perfectly on top of something that had been on his family's property for over a hundred years an old stone basement from a farmhouse that had burned down in the 1890s. His father had told him stories about that original house, about how the basement had always stayed cool in summer and somehow held warmth in winter, about how the thick stone walls that some ancestor had carefully stacked seemed to have some kind of natural magic to them. And while most people would have filled in that old basement or ignored it completely, Robert had a different idea, an idea that sounded crazy when he first explained it to his skeptical brother-in-law over beers at the local tavern. He was going to buy a Quonset hut for $300. He was going to clear out that old stone basement, shore up its walls, and then he was going to set that curved metal structure right on top of it, essentially creating a home that was half underground, wrapped in stone, and topped with military-grade steel. His brother-in-law laughed. His neighbors shook their heads. And even the guy who sold him the Quonset hut asked him three times if he was sure he knew what he was doing. But Robert had done his homework in a way that would make any modern engineer proud and what he understood about thermal mass, about how stone holds heat, about how being partially underground protects you from wind and extreme temperature swings, was about to turn his strange little project into the warmest home in Rutland County. The work started in April of night, right when the ground thawed enough to let Robert get down into that old basement and assess what he was dealing with, and what he found was better than he'd hoped. Thick stone walls, nearly two feet across in some places, that had been laid by craftsmen who knew their trade. Men who'd built foundations meant to outlast generations. Robert spent three weeks just cleaning out decades of accumulated debris, hauling out rotted timbers from the original house, clearing away soil that had washed in through gaps, and carefully examining every stone to make sure the walls were still structurally sound. And to his amazement and relief, aside from a few spots that needed repointing with fresh mortar, those walls were as solid as the day they'd been built. He worked mostly alone, occasionally with help from his younger brother Thomas and together they reinforced the walls where needed, added support beams across the ceiling of the basement space, and created a level surface on top where the Quonset hut would eventually sit. When Zaddy wasn't just stacking a metal building on top of stone, the real trick, the thing that made Robert's design so clever, he was creating an integrated system where the basement would become the primary living space while the Quonset hut above would serve as both roof and insulation barrier, with a small upper level for sleeping dot. When the Quonset hut arrived in June on the back of an army surplus truck, it came in sections like a giant erector set. Curved ribs of corrugated steel that would bolt together to form that distinctive half-cylinder shape, and Robert and Thomas spent two solid weeks assembling it, following instructions that were written for military engineers but had to be adapted for their unusual situation. Most Quonset huts were simply bolted to concrete pads at ground level, but Robert's had to be carefully anchored to the stone walls below which meant custom fabricating metal brackets and drilling into century-old stone. Delicate work that had to be done right, or the whole structure could fail. By August, the basic structure was up, and that's when Robert began the interior work that would make all the difference. Starting with digging out the basement floor, another two feet deeper, 
which gave him eight-foot ceilings in the underground portion, and created eight even more thermal mass as the exposed earth below would maintain a constant temperature year-round. He installed a small wood stove in the basement, not a big one, just a modest cast iron unit that he'd bought used, and he positioned it carefully so its heat would radiate through the stone walls and up into the quonset space above. And then he did something that seemed wasteful to everyone who saw it. He insulated the inside of the Quonset hut with every scrap of material he could find. Old wool blankets from the war, leftover fiberglass batting from a construction job, even newspaper and cardboard in some sections, creating a thick barrier between the metal exterior and the living space. His neighbors thought he was being paranoid, over-engineering a solution to a problem that might not even exist. But Robert understood something they didn't, which was that his stone basement would act like a giant thermal battery, absorbing heat during the day and releasing it slowly at night while the earth surrounding those walls would maintain a constant 50-degree temperature, regardless of what was happening outside. Meaning he'd only need to add a little bit of heat from his wood stove to keep the whole space comfortable. By the time October rolled around and the first cold nights arrived, Robert had moved in with his wife Helen and their two young daughters. And they were about to discover whether his wild experiment would work or whether they de just built them themselves the most expensive cold storage unit in Vermont. That first winter became the stuff of local legend. Not because anything went wrong, but because everything went so incredibly right in ways that seemed to defy common sense and basic physics to anyone who did UNT understand what Robert had created. When the temperature outside dropped to 10 below zero in December, a temperature that had other families burning through there would supplies at alarming rates. And still, watching ice form on the inside of their windows, Robert's thermometer inside his stone basement home read a comfortable 68 degrees and he'd only burn through a quarter of the wood that a normal house would have required. His secret was the thermal mass of those stone walls combined with the Earth's constant temperature, which meant that the basement never got as cold as the outside air, and the small amount of heat from his wood stove, instead of escaping immediately through thin walls and windows like in a normal house, was absorbed by the stone and radiated back slowly and evenly throughout the day and night. Helen McNamara later told the Rutland Herald that she'd been skeptical when Robert first proposed the idea. She'd imagined living in a dark, damp cave, but instead, she found their home to be consistently comfortable, surprisingly bright thanks to the windows Robert had installed in the Quonset Hut's upper level, and so much quieter than their previous house because the earth and stone absorbed sound as effectively as they regulated temperature. The real test came in January of 1948, when a massive blizzard hit Vermont, the kind of storm that old-timers still talk about today. With winds so strong, they tore roofs off barns and temperatures that stayed below zero for five straight days. And while the rest of Rutland battened down and suffered, Robert's family barely noticed. They actually used less wood during the blizzard than they had in the milder weeks before it because the wind, which was stealing heat from every other house in the county, couldn't reach their stone-wrapped basement home. Word spread quickly after that storm. And by spring, Robert had a steady stream of visitors, neighbors and strangers alike, who wanted to see this miraculous warm house for themselves. And while some came away convinced and inspired, others remained skeptical, unable to believe that something so simple could work so well without some kind of trick or hidden expense. Robert tried to explain the principles to anyone who would listen, how thermal mass works, how earth-sheltered homes had been used for centuries in other parts of the world, how the military's Quonset hut design, when used creatively, could be part of an efficient home rather than just a temporary structure. But for most people, it was easier to stick with what they knew, conventional houses with conventional heating problems than to try something that seemed so radically different. A few people did follow Robert's example, including his brother Thomas, who built a similar structure on the other side of Rutland, and a farmer named Dutch Steinberg, who adapted the design for a workshop that stayed warm enough all winter for him to continue his woodworking without any heat source at all, except what the earth provided, but these remained exceptions rather than the rule. Today, Robert McNamara's original stone basement Quonset home still stands in Rutland, though it has been modified over the years and is currently owned by a retired teacher who marvels at how little propane she uses compared to her neighbors. And while modern earth-sheltered homes and passive solar design have proven that Robert was ahead of his time, his name isn't in any architecture, textbooks, or sustainable living guides. If this story made you think differently about building and heating, hit that subscribe button because next week I am covering another forgotten innovator who solved an impossible problem with nothing but creativity and determination. And if you want to see photos of Robert S.'s actual home and the original blueprints he sketched out, I've linked everything in the description below.